Hello, beautiful people. You are listening to the Communal Table Podcast, part of Food and Wine Pro. My guest today, it's really, really weird to be talking to him, uh, not in person, because full disclosure, uh, one of my closest friends uh, who I've known for a long time, he's a restaurant industry veteran uh, and uh, incredible. I just, I think back at all the places he he's worked, uh, Charlie Trotter, Gary Denko, uh, Danielle, and uh, the last restaurant that he opened, uh, Batard, uh, won the James Beard Award for Best New Restaurant. He is currently uh, opening up a new restaurant called Francie in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And as we all happen to know, these are pretty challenging times. How are you holding up, John Winterman? I'm actually living quite well. Uh, thank you for asking. Yeah. So uh, yeah. <laughs> you're in a unique situation. That means I'm remaining extremely positive. Yeah. I, I like that about you. <laughs> it's thing I've always appreciated about you. Um, because these, good God, these are scary times. Yeah, yeah, we're, it's, how do I put this? I, when we're talking to my partner, Chris, we can't figure out a plan anymore because everything has been thrown out the window. So the opening dates, the uh, schedule, the hiring schedule, like getting into the kitchen, hanging hood exhaust systems, uh, even the idea of like when we might open, how many people can be involved, who's going to be going out, are they going to have limitations on it? What restaurants are actually going to make it through this? Uh, you know, there's there's no way. There's no way to plan for this. So we're just doing our best. Yeah. How many years have you been in the industry? Uh, I like to say I got fired from my first restaurant job in 1986. <laughs> okay. So you've been going strong ever since. For the most part, yeah. <laughs> and you, yeah. And you have mostly worked fine dining. Mostly. There's some casual, some really casual stuff in the beginning, uh, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Yeah, but you, I, I think there were pizza places. There were yes, uh, uh, delivered pizza. I've done dishwashing, busing tables, and you know, along the way, I learned a number of different things. I, I worked in a, I wouldn't call it a real kitchen, but I worked in a kitchen of sorts at one point in Colorado. That was basically me making sandwiches. I will say to this day, you still plate very well. You still cook very well. <laughs> yes, and you were. Uh, how long were you with Danielle? Uh, about nine years altogether. Okay, and you were Maybe at, just over. Yeah, and you were with at, uh, with him at various places before uh, you opened Batard. And so this is the first time that you, so you opened this restaurant, restaurant, um, but it was technically within a group. So this is the first time that you're opening up on your own. Yes, it is. It is. Um, Batard was a great experience, but uh, a lot of things were already in place. Uh, so we could go in and there was a certain amount of the opening process we, we got to grow into and learn from and a certain amount that we just never were exposed to. Um, yeah. You know, that exposure we have now, uh, I wish somebody told me how expensive it was to get an engineer, but, yeah. you know, you live and learn. Yeah. And the thing is like, you know, you're in a different position that you, you didn't have to lay anybody off, fire anyone. So you're in, in a weird way. I know it sounds so weird to say this, but I keep thinking, you know, as horrifying as this is for the entire industry and you've been in the industry for all of this time and you have so many, you know, close friends and, and former colleagues in, in the industry and everybody's suffering right now. And I keep saying like, you know, this is awful for everyone, but you didn't have to let go of anybody while you were doing this. No, we, we had a couple of people who were going to be coming on board. Strangely, uh, they were supposed to start today. Uh, oh, wow. Three, okay. Three managers. Uh, I'm sorry, four. There were two, they were going to be in the kitchen, three in the kitchen, one in the front of the house. So, um, yeah, they were supposed to start today, but at that point, we only had uh, offer letters out, and okay. we, nobody had gotten on payroll. Um, that would have started all this week, so we did get yeah. we did dodge a bullet on that one. Um, so, you know, we also didn't lose any inventory. Um, you know, the restaurant was still probably about five or six weeks away from being handed over as a finished project. Um, so we we did dodge a bullet, and I'm not gonna. I'm going to say I'm not the luckiest guy in the world, but we are very, very lucky in that regard. Yeah. So how far uh, down the line have you gotten? Because you're doing full build out on this. Yes. We were, if we had gone by the, let's see, our, our contractor was very, very on schedule to hand us over the space by the end of April. I've been gobsmacked by how on yeah. time so much of this has gone. Yeah. It's a good Korean contractor, you know, so... <laughs> um, 
we uh we were on schedule for that and ideally we were going to be hanging the hood system in uh this week and they needed about seven days to get all the kitchen equipment and after that so i ideally chris would have been uh handed a complete kitchen okay about two can weeks you tell now. people who chris is I apologize. It's a Chris Chipalone, yeah. my chef partner, former uh, one Michelin star at Piora. Do you remember that restaurant? You know, I never got to go, but I've had the pleasure of having a few of his things uh, in between. I was actually really looking forward to this dinner that you were scheduled to do at the Beard House, which of course is is canceled as well. Yes. Um, so you are you're seeing so many people who you love and respect uh, facing this right now, and like I said, you have. You know, such a pedigree in all of these these restaurants. Just because these people have ha- have these long standing uh, institutions of fine dining, this hasn't uh, sort of immunized them from the stuff that everybody else is is going through as well. And I think that's a that's been a really interesting thing to think about because, you know, I read something from Danny Meyer. Uh, I think it, in the last couple of weeks where he was saying that even though he has all of these restaurants, he's still technically an independent restaurateur. So yeah, nobody has a plan for this. Like, right, right. you know, you can see somebody who is, you know, like a Dynex, like a, you know, like an empire, like, you know, people keep saying like, Hey, you know, I see this thing that says Tom Colicchio has $20 million. Why doesn't he give all this money? And he's like, let me print out that article and give it, bring it to my bank. Because people, <laughs> people, people think of, um, you know, yeah, high end restaurants yeah. and stuff as, uh, you know, the people just being you know, rolling in money, but they're not. Yeah, they're they're not they're not. I mean, you can make it make a good living at it, but it's you're not rolling in money by yeah, any means. Yeah, and I think somebody so, so restaurateurs, uh, you know, your Danny Al and your Danny Meyer and those guys are better prepared to weather something like this. But the longer it stretches, the the less the less they're going to be prepared. And I I I, I have like a, a palpable sense of terror about what's not going to come back in. Four yeah. and a half weeks from now, you know, and some of them, um, you know, uh, my wife and I are, are sitting here in Park Slope, and and two nights a week we try to get an option from a local restaurant that, you know, normally doesn't do delivery or takeout. And we're trying to help keep them afloat the best we can, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, what is it? I mean, we're just we're only two people, you know, so I can see them trying, and these these local, you know, restaurants with one location, they. Uh, they don't have the ability to survive this and I don't know how they're going to do it. Yeah. I mean, I, my, you know, Douglas and I, uh, have sat at a lot of those restaurants with you and Jen and, uh, my heart breaks, uh, you know, thinking about all, you know, all those beautiful nights and those, those places that we've relied on where we've been, you know, the last people sitting around the bar at stone park, or, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, that's the place I keep coming back to. I know you live on a, a the down the block from a place called Benchmark that you go to a lot. Douglas and I go to yeah. uh, Nuevo Mexico uh, near us. And, and you know, it's it's a really terrifying thing because it, it's such a, a fundamental part of our lives um, going away. And nobody's, no, I keep saying this, but nobody's immune from it, whether it's, you know, the, the diner where we you know, go for a, you know, hungover omelet. Yeah. I think yeah. seventh Avenue um, donuts that we go to a block from us. It's been around for good God, decades and decades. It's open 24 hours and you know, they have, they have counter service and you can sit there and have like a proper old fashioned diner experience. And I'm so worried about a place mm-hmm. like that, that, you know, the check average was never going to be big there. You know, we're both in and out for breakfast with, for a little, you know, for not that much money. And, and almost, it's, it's almost guaranteed that a place like that doesn't have uh, three months of uh, revenue sitting in the bank, you know, just in yeah. case there's a rainy day. Yeah. And, you know, and, and go ahead. Oh no, go on. Finish that thought. Yeah, I just uh, the, these places are the fabric of our neighborhood, and anytime people have asked me over the past couple of weeks how they can do to help, the yeah, there's there's general funds out there that are being raised, um, and those are good because they sort of uh, they disperse the money in a in a, a hopefully democratic way. Um, uh, my wife and I have contributed to a couple of GoFundMe accounts, which I'm not going to mention because I don't want anybody yeah. having feelings for whatever reason. Yeah, I understand. Uh, but you know, the best way is. A restaurant that doesn't normally do delivery or takeout, they just try to patronize it. Try to get there and, and skip the Grubhub thing and just call direct, put a mask on, go down and pick it up. And they've, they're basically very good at like, you know, 
finding out who you are, handing the food out the door. And uh, in fact, we went to a, a butcher on Atlantic Avenue the other day, called in an order, had scheduled a time to pick it up. The guy comes out, he checks everybody in. Nobody's allowed in the, in the butcher shop at all. And um, they just hand you your package with a name on it. You know, that's about the easiest way to do it. Um, but, you know, it, 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 for us, it's a little bit less convenient to do it that way. Uh, but it's, I, don't, I feel much better supporting a local butcher or a local restaurant than I do. Amazon yeah, right now. No, I'm uh, right with you on this. And uh, because you have such a, a deep knowledge of restaurants and you've worked in it for such a long time, maybe you're the person he, who can sort of unpack uh, who are the employees in a restaurant. I know that sounds like such a basic thing, but who are the people who customers might not know even exist in a restaurant? Oh, probably I think the food runners, the porters, those are the, the faceless people. I think sometimes they just kind of whisk in and out of the dining room. They have something in their hands when they come out. They drop it somewhere. They pick something up on the way back. They're the, uh, you know, the heart and soul. I think the runners, the busters, the porters, they're the ones, you know, that if they, uh, what was I reading? There was something that was written about 2011 that said, you know, if you, all the CEOs of the world disappeared, we'd probably get on pretty well. But if, like, you take away the, the, the cashiers and the grocery store clerks and the secretaries, we'll grind to a halt pretty quickly. Um, it's like that in a restaurant, you know? It's... Um, the the workhorses, uh, as I said, the runners, the busters, the porters, and those are the ones that you know. If your dishwasher walks off the job, you you can't you can't continue. Oh, you're yeah. Your kitchen, you crash, right? If the dishwasher, yeah. you know, if, I lose, I, if we have a full staff one or busy, one of my waiters gets mad and leaves. I mean, it's it's bad, but I, you know, we can figure it out. Yeah. You know, but like a dishwasher leaves, man, that's terrible. You know, yeah. those guys are those guys are faceless in a lot of ways, uh, and I shouldn't just say guys; those people are faceless. Um, in a lot of ways, a lot of people don't see them, how important they are um, to, you know, a, a restaurant is, is, it circulates, you know, nobody has enough product where they can just endlessly pull out glassware, silverware, plates, et cetera. Like it, everything has to be recycled, reused and cleaned in between, you know? I, I, um, and there's somebody has to do well, it. Well, I actually remember you calling in your wife one night to, to polish glasses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. I did. I forgot about that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's important. I mean, either the second you put down a, a spotty or fingerprinted glass or a glass with lipstick in front of somebody, oh my God, yeah. hell breaks loose. You know, but they don't realize there's a person back there whose sole job it is to clean those glasses and make sure they're out there for you crystal clear. Yeah. And let's talk about those people for a second because, uh, I mean, honestly, they tend to be people of color, right? Yep. yep. Im yep. Immigrants generally. Generally, yes. Pay, on on the pay scale, are they the lowest paid people? Who is who are the lowest paid people? Generally, yeah, they're going to be the lower paid people. If you're smart, you you don't pay them super low. Uh, you want to give them um, a live, uh, try to give them a living wage as much as possible because you want to make sure that they're able to you're able to keep them because otherwise you're just in this in the cycle of new people, new faces, paperwork, and training. Um, but yeah, they tend to be on the lower you know uh, side of the scale for sure, um, and yeah, they tend to be immigrants, um, which is fine. I mean, uh, working at Danielle was probably the most diverse yeah. place I ever worked. I mean, and, uh, you know, those guys were the backbone and they would, you know, and Danielle was smart. He, you know, people got the training and they learned the job and they had the chance to move up and get promoted. And, um, you know, I saw that firsthand for nine I mean, years. The restaurant industry years. would crash and burn um, without immigrants. There's absolutely no way it could exist. And, Oh, Actually, okay, this yeah, country so, yes. will crash and burn. I mean, isn't there something right now, uh, you know, basically uh, the supply lines for groceries, it's basically undocumented migrant workers that are getting everything to your plate yeah. right now as you're yeah, sitting in I quarantine. Mean, I, people are, I think the lowest paid you people know? are sort of asked to put their lives at risk right now. And so what happens to somebody if they're, you know, a porter, a dishwasher, et cetera, and their restaurant closes down? What are their options? It's sadly not a lot. You know, it's, um, I, I really don't know what their options are at this point is if you, especially if you're not carrying the proper documentation, it's going to be really hard, if not impossible to file for any sort of benefit or unemployment. Um, yeah. no, it's, it's a, it's a sad thing. And it's, it's, it permeated throughout this industry because you not only have the, the guys who the team who's working in the, the kitchen and the front of the house, but you have all that supply chain that funnels the product into the restaurant. Whether it's the you know the detergents for dishwashing, or it's linen companies, uh, any purveyors, salespeople, 
the entire beverage industry, coffee, tea, you know, you name it. It's a, there's a lot, there's a lot of domino effect there. And it's not just immigrants working in the dish machine. They're immigrants are working all the way uh, along the uh, supply chain and it's exposing something everybody knew mm -hmm. um, that it's exposing this uh, very large sector of our economy that's un unprotected. Yeah. yeah. No you know, health care. And some of us, yeah, some of us are very lucky in, 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 in that we have the option and we have the ability to ride this out for a, a time yeah. being. Um, and uh, But a lot of people don't. And, and I really don't know what they can or are going to do. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been saying the, you know, this is dangerous for so many reasons, this pandemic, uh, but it really, really has exposed this incredibly leaky foundation on which the entire industry is, is, is built. And I know that you and I talk a lot about, about things and especially as you've been opening and you were already planning to do some structurally different things than you were at other places that you've worked. How has everything going on right now uh, changed uh, you know, employee handbook, uh, you know, ways that things are structured. So has, has it changed what you were planning on doing? Uh, no, we were trying to initiate a lot of different uh, benefits for our staff in the beginning. Uh, we can't do everything on day one. We need to build up to some of it, but we haven't even opened our doors. And I started exploring like health insurance plans for the staff. You know, yeah. um, I want to make sure that uh, uh, vacation pay is in there, you know, personal time off. Um, obviously, there's there's stuff with sick pay from the state of New York, which I wish would go national. Um, you know, we even talked about like having like a group gym membership where I could get it like at some local gym near the restaurant where I can get like a discount and everybody has like a membership that can go and use the gym if they want to. Um, we we talked about a number of different things. Those are still all all in the table, but we wanted to be a bit more progressive for a small independent restaurant with one location than most people would, I think, have the balls to do in the beginning. So we're still pushing for that. Yeah. You know, it just, it's just hard to think about because, you know, the health insurance being tied to employment, <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. so the, the people, you know, at Batard, we offered uh, uh, health insurance to our staff and the, the, the restaurant would, pay 25% of that, which is, which is fine. Uh, but they're closed right now. And the stipulation is you have to work uh, an average of 32 hours a week, I think, to keep qualified for yeah. the health insurance. So, so what happens? It's, it's a, I can't really answer a question on this blog post. Yeah. So, you know, we want to try to put a, 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 some sort of safety net in place for our staff. Yeah. You know? Cause I and I don't know exactly how it is. Yeah, yet, but so you are uh, one of the, one of the reasons that I've always said you're so good at what you do is because you're a person first, and all of the, you know, and in, in all these things. And I always say, like, you know, while you were Maitre D at Danielle, you still remembered that you were a kid from Indiana, and that is such a fundamentally yeah. important uh, thing. I mean, do you feel like you know we we've talked a lot over the years about this kitchen culture that you know was always the very pirate ship kind of thing and raucous and rowdy and stuff and you know there's a there's a certain amount of that that's really healthy but i feel like you know especially through this there was it was trending toward this uh before before all of it uh, and now definitely that um there's going to be more of a sense of empathy throughout empathy equity um all all of that to i mean I, I've been trying to figure out what this is all going to look like. And, um, and you know, when people, I, I have to believe that there's a future for restaurants. I absolutely have to believe that um, because the people, I, I keep reminding people who are, um, you know, depressed and at home and away from the lives that they gave up absolutely everything else to do, uh, you know, cut out the, you know, getting to have time with their family, having friends, all this stuff and they're at home, like not knowing what the hell to do. And I keep saying like, you're still a chef, you're still a bartender, you're still all of, you know, all, all of these things. Um, you're, you're still that person, you know, uh, it's, right, right. Uh, it's been an unhealthy system up to this point. And, uh, but I, I feel like I've seen so many people checking in on each other. Do you feel like it's going to be a, a kinder uh, culture after this? Yeah, it was, it was already heading in that direction. I'm, I'm interested to see where, how long this uh, goodwill lasts between everybody, <laughs> yeah. everybody uh, after this is all over. Um, you know, I, that, that culture was on the way out um, over the past two decades, really, where you still have to have firmness and you still have to have discipline and you still have to have, be able to like tell somebody, you know, you did this incorrectly. This is the proper way to do it. 
but there does need to be the name calling and the harassment and the insults and the screaming and the plate throwing. That's 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 just childish tantrum behavior anyway. Yeah. Um, you you know, um, I I hope it's kinder coming through this. I hope everybody gets a little bit of a sense of perspective on things um, and you know, kind of how fragile our system yeah. is. You know, I think if you had asked anybody a year ago, they would have said there's there's absolutely no way that this city would ever close down like this. Sure. But uh, I uh, I broke the rule slightly yesterday and I, I took my scooter out and I was riding around midtown Manhattan yesterday afternoon by myself. And you're on the corner of 42nd and 6th Avenue uh, at about two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon in early spring, and it's like 58 degrees, and the sun is shining, oh, and there's nobody there. Everything was closed. Bryant Park was empty. I was sitting at a stoplight with one other car next to me, and I could see the next stoplight, and there's only one other car, and I saw yeah. maybe four people walking on the sidewalk. And it was just the most – I can't even no. compare it. It's not like, you know, a slow morning is like, okay, it's 7 a.m. on a Christmas morning. I'm like I, – I, I was telling Chris, my chef partner, like, it's – it's, I've seen nights where we have 17 inches of snow in the ground and it's the second week of January and at <laughs> midnight you still have traffic. Like the city does not shut down. And it was just, it was the most bizarre thing. Um, and it's different. You know, I, I went up sixth Avenue, I went down seventh Avenue, went back up 10th, I crossed to the Upper East Side yeah. and it, it yeah. didn't get any better. I, <laughs> it's, <laughs> you know, I came home with the most, most eerie feeling I've ever had. It wasn't quite, uh, um, the apocalypse, but it felt like it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I I've been walking around our neighborhood, uh, you know, walk walking our dog Penelope, you know Penelope very very well, and I'll yes. go, I'll go for blocks and not see anyone, and it's it, you know, and it's strange when I when I do, and you know, I have to believe, you know, we're tough New Yorkers, we're we're you know, I keep saying we're going to get through this, but not everybody is, and you right. know, right. what do you think? there's room for fine dining after this do you think there's room for high protocol white tablecloth you know that kind of serve but oh, you know my answer you know my answer yes, to that. But I, yes. See, yes, I do but i want everybody else to hear it it's people you know people still like formality they still like you know a celebration they still they still want to ha- you know i know right now we're walking around the neighborhoods with plastic cups full of uh, you know yeah, mascot some, negronis, some but like maybe. at a certain point we want to get back some of us, you want to, at a certain point, we do want to get back and have a wine glass or a plate. And we, we're, you know, we're not nesting at home in sweatpants. We're going to put on some nice clothes and go out. And, you know, I, I was talking to a friend today who is actually in Texas right now. And, I, and she asked me what I thought was missing. And I said, look, we're kind of heading into the second busiest time of the year in New York. You've got spring break is over, April and May. You've got Passover and Easter. You've gone into Mother's Day. The weather's changed. And yet we can't do anything. And restaurants are affected, and hotels are affected, and every business is affected. And there's kids missing out right now in their graduation. My, yeah, my my grandniece uh, is her prom was canceled, and and she was having some feelings about it. Yeah, I cannot imagine. I cannot imagine uh, six weeks before my senior year of high school graduation. I mean, first of all, yeah, I want to get a hell out of high school no matter what, but I can't imagine yeah. having like that last six weeks taken away. You know, just just one day you're in school and you're looking forward and you're making plans. And next day you're like, you're, you're finishing your, 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 yeah, your I mean, uh, diploma from home and you, that's it. And uh, there's, there's, there's so much lost right now. And I, I don't know how it's going to come back. I think people will still come back with a, uh, a degree of sophistication that they want to go out and they want to support these restaurants again. But, you know, it's, I think the the major change is going to be, you know, how we treat each other. Maybe if it comes out of it, that somebody, is a little less rude or obnoxious because they realize that there's an immigrant back there washing their dishes, then that's a good thing too, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, good God, the more kindness, the better. I really, truly. I mean, I, unfortunately, I've seen some of the opposite where people are being really, truly horrible to, you know, cashiers, et cetera. And like, just screw you. You don't deserve a nice meal if you're going to be terrible to people. But... Yeah. Well, those people have their own sad existence anyway, and they'll get it in the end, I guess. But yeah, yeah. So, if you can build for me in your head, what would be your dream day of New York eating? Where do you like? If you were just plotting out a day or a weekend in New York City dining, what would that look like? You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna start that by saying I, this is the other sad thing is I've got a really great working list of places that I, I 
that I recommend that it's always constantly being tweaked. Yeah. So if somebody's coming in town, they say, what do you recommend? I, I shoot in this list and it's kind of broken down like anywhere from, from a Michelin three star down all the way down to like a good dive bar. But yet I'm looking at that list. And I'm like, I, I don't know what, of what are these places are going to make it? I, I really don't know. And it's this, that's no, terrible. That's what I'm saying. Like this is, this is our act of hope right here. So wind back a month or however long ago, I, yeah. I've lost absolute track of how long this has been going on, but let's say this a couple months ago. Um, I went to see river dance. I think on March 12th or so <laughs> with my husband, March 14th. Yes. <laughs> of all things. Yes. Um, so winding back, I mean, you know, uh, Jen and I, my wife Jen and I love we love Gramercy Tavern. Oh, it's so good. You know, and it was we were there pretty close to I wouldn't say the last day, but maybe it was things started shutting down about ten days later. And uh we went in, in the evening and without a reservation and they asked to take my phone number for the wait list and I kinda knew as soon as they took my phone number. So like literally three minutes later, <laughs> like, oh, right this way. Um but you know, Gramercy Tavern uh, among a, a a lot of places. Gramercy Tavern is um, is one of those places that just really, it just really yeah. represents Manhattan yeah. right now. I mean, I'm thinking Keynes. Yeah, I had a reservation on the 23rd. I had to, yeah. I had to yeah. lose it. it, closed. And if Keynes doesn't come back, I'll be really upset too because that's like just fabric of the city. That's history, a hundred years, you know. Yeah, uh, over. I mean, that was the late 1800s, I think. It was yeah, open and- yeah, over a hundred years, probably 130. Um, I'm but, thinking you of. Know, the Selka, oh God, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, I, 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 I'm thinking, you know, I want to go out in Chinatown and get uh, some incredible. I love the Selka, right? Yeah, the Selka, I, and but like going out in Chinatown and getting some dim sum, and you know, yeah. go into Seventh Avenue uh, Donuts. You know, it's it's one of those restaurants that has like a thousand names, but I think it's technically yeah. Seventh Avenue Donuts. Uh, yeah, uh, even going back in the Gramercy, uh, I, I want to go back to Casa Mono. You yeah. Know? Um, and then, um, the place that I kind of randomly discovered, um, Jimmy Neary's, uh, over on the weird Avenue, I think it's like 57th and first mm-hmm. or something like that. And you know, that, like the old Irish bar that's been there and like owned by the same guy since the sixties and yeah, you know? Don- Donovan's but, uh, in Queens where they have such a great burger and, and yeah. you know, all those places yeah. along the seven train. And, you know, I get lazy sometimes as a New Yorker thinking like, ah, this stuff is going to be here. I can always go out and, and mm-hmm. you know, That's stupid trick, me really. for taking this stuff for, for granted. And, but yeah. we do have something to look forward to and that is Francie. So what is yeah. Francie going to be like? Francie is going to be, Hopefully the restaurant that one of the restaurants is needed to when we come out of the other side of all this, it's going to be a New York brasserie with American and French and Italian influence. Um, it's going to be a neighborhood restaurant. It's going to be a restaurant that people want to go want to cross a river or two from, you know, to get to. Um, we have, I think we're going to have just a beautiful, beautiful uh, restaurant where we, when the people walk in, if I think the, the feel of it's going to be that, that it's going to feel when you walk in as if it's been there for a decade already, you know, and that's not to say it looks dated. It's going to look just classic. Um, you know, and our architect is really great with lighting and textures and it's going to be a, a, the kind of bar and the kind of room that, uh, I mean, I, I even saw just the rendering of the bar and I wanted to have a drink there immediately. Oh, I, I, yeah. And, I was kind of tearing up looking at it. And it's going to, it's going to get open, you know? Yeah. And I hear there's going to be a hell of a bourbon slush on the menu. That's going to be an opening cocktail. I got to figure out how to do it logistically, <laughs> but uh, for folks listening to this, I uh, I make a really good bourbon slush that uh, John has had some of throughout the years. <laughs> I've had probably a, a gallon. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know it's good damn stuff, and I, I you know I can't wait to go there. I can't wait to go to some of the places. Um, you know, in upstate New York that we both love so much and more than anything, like it's like I was saying, it's so freaking weird. You are my brother and yeah. it kills me that we can't be like sitting next to each other on the couch doing this, uh, sharing a cocktail. Cause, um, I- I'm going to say like, I can't wait to sit at your bar and I can't wait to hug you and your wife again. Yep. You, you didn't ask me the one question I was, I was actually really prepared for. Okay. What's that? How's your hair looking right now? Oh, it looks fabulous, but um, <laughs> um, 
<laughs> historical figure I'd like to, uh, or somebody I'd like to have dinner with, like a fantasy. Okay. Well, should we, should we do the, the questions that I usually ask? No, let's, let's do it. Let's do okay. It. So I remember what the usual questions are. Okay. Have you ever cried in the walk-in? No. Okay. Have you ever made anybody else cry in the walk-in? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, <laughs> no shame. I've done that. But yes, I have made somebody cry. And it wasn't like an ex-wife or anything like that. It was, it was actually a, a, it was somebody we worked with at, at Trotters. Too. And I will note, that John nice. did, in fact, meet his ex-wife at a restaurant where they both worked. So. <laughs> True. Yeah. Um, uh, wow, it's been a while since I've done the questions. My brain is melting. What is the toughest job in a restaurant? Toughest job in a restaurant? Oh, Christ. That's, uh, I, I really have to go with, like, probably daytime porter. Yeah, honestly, there's receiving... There's unpacking, there's yeah. you know, invoices, yeah. and then also cleaning. They, they they clean everything, you know? There's a lot of responsibility on the uh, daytime porter. I swear I'm telling uh, the food and wine team that next year we're doing best new porter or yeah. <laughs> best existing porter, whatever, best porter. There is actually a publication in Ireland that did like porter of the year, which I thought was pretty great. I That's very yeah. cool. Yeah. If Danny, if Danny Meyer's listening, tell him, uh, yeah, he's got the power to like uh, start paying the porters a lot more. I'm gonna, I uh, hey Danny Meyer, <laughs> listen to this. I'll make. Uh, I will follow I'm, suit. I will follow. I will suit. tag him in this. Um, okay, so a question uh, from my colleague Meg Soul. What? Okay, the two different cookbooks. Uh, what is the classic cook- cookbook? What is the new cookbook that is your go-to? Uh, a classic cookbook. Classic. Yeah, like what? What? What is one that you, has just been your go-to forever? That is a fine question. Caught me off guard on that one. Because I, <laughs> I think I have some of your cook- cookbooks at my house. You, you probably do. Um, uh, one of my go-tos, though, when I'm kind of in a stumped for something, and it's usually when it's something that's actually fairly straightforward, and I can't think it because I haven't done it for a while. Like literally yesterday, I made leeks vinaigrette, and like in the morning, I'm like, hey, wait, how do I make leeks vinaigrette again? I can't, you can put that in so, your sleep, man. <laughs> I, yeah, I know, I know, but sometimes like you get, you just get muddled, and I was, and then like I, I went to like one of my old Mark Bittman cookbooks, which is I've got a half a dozen of his, um, the titles of which I what, yeah. was it How to Cook Everything. I honestly thought you yeah. were going to say Donna Hay. <laughs> no, I like the Donna Hay books, but there's so there's so many good ones that I can't say just one necessarily. I feel um, like I know your favorite new cookbook though. Uh, I really might. Surprised. It's a tie right now. It's a tie between um, Alpine Cooking and the Claridge's cookbook. You see, I was right on Alpine Cooking. I knew you were going to say You're that. You're right about the author because it's both Meredith Erickson. Oh, she did both of them. Wow. She did okay. Claridge's, and Claridge's is just such a brilliant hotel cookbook. I had my uh, honeymoon um, the first night of it. They upgraded us to the uh, honeymoon suite. Yeah, uh, which was this is why this is why you're still married because you went to Claridge's. <laughs> I'm also still married because my husband is my favorite person in the universe. So there's that. He, but, uh... He's my he's my maybe second favorite. <laughs> <laughs> you're my second favorite. Um, yeah. But it's uh, and well, I'm, well, you and your wife they can tie. Actually, she's a little bit ahead. Maybe. Um, what is your? <laughs> I said that so she wouldn't kill me. Um, I do love her very, very, very much. And you have my third favorite dog. What is your go-to comfort food? Go-to comfort food? Mm. Probably a one or another variation of uh, a standard ham sandwich. Mm. And when I say variation, it could be a full-on like hero roll, you know, like it could be hot in the oven. It could be with like a simple baguette with a, with a, a little bit of cheese on it. it, you know. In fact, right before this conversation, I had a Black Forest ham and mayonnaise on rye, and that was it. Oh, that sounds so good. Oh, you know, but like I, I, I will eat a variation of a ham sandwich like almost any time, anywhere. Egg, cheese, lettuce, tomato, mayonnaise, you name it, it's all over. Oh my god, that sounds. I really want one right now. I actually smelled Douglas uh, making one earlier, and it was because uh, he was heating it, and it smelled really amazing. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. What is the last meal that you had that made you emotional? Uh, probably every time I have a meal with my wife. Yeah. So the last one was uh, last night we did some angel hair pasta with pesto and we got I grilled those up. And yeah, it was just eating together with my wife is always an emotional thing. And did you make the pesto from your uh, your your deck garden? No, not actually. Um, you know, the, being home has one advantage in that we have a very, very complete 
pantry and <laughs> going through and finding stuff we bought like three years ago and trying to use it up. So um, this is a, a pesto that we had, uh, we bought when we came back from Italy in 2013. And this is also a polite way of saying his wife is the single uh, best hoarder and smuggler of food I have ever met in my life. Girls got taste. <laughs> and it, um, You got the cod liver we sent over? I did. Thank you so much. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, try, again, like it's been, uh, it's been a while since I've done the questions. Oh, this one is going to hit me in the heart, this question. And I think I mm-hmm. probably know the answer to this one, too. Uh, what is the last meal that somebody cooked for you in their home? Uh, when was that? It's been a while now. We've already been a quarantine for like three and a half weeks. I assume Lauren and Phil. If we go back to that night. Yeah, that's right. You're right. Um, yeah, she got one of those sort of, um, it's, it's not a, uh, like electric skillet, but something similar. We put it in the middle of the table and it just keeps the broth warm. And it's like almost like a shabu shabu style. And you, you kind of like, uh, just kind of cook everything in front of you. Price. That's yeah. That's already almost, that's a month ago now. Yeah, that's, that's um, hard to think that that was a while ago. And I always yeah, we had we had they had gone down to um, the Japanese market in um, um, Industry City, and they brought back a bunch of sliced meats and some mushrooms, and like um, we just we cooked that all together and had a blast. Uh, I will note that I found out yesterday that that market uh, is actually delivering. It's Sunrise Market, and they're delivering wow. uh, right. via Mercado. I actually almost texted your wife that earlier today. Um, yeah. Good to know. This next question is built for you. Prepare. What, what okay. living musician would you want to cook for and what would you cook for them? You know, strangely, not strangely, not so strange. I'm going to go Michael Stipe. What would you uh, he made he made a video uh, uh like the, he he sang the bunker song on uh, uh underneath the bunker on um like a Twitter video that I saw a couple weeks ago and I, I couldn't stop listening to it for like 12 hours. I got to find that. Like we have water. You know, I don't know. We have wine. Yeah. I don't know what his diet is. I don't know if he's like, is he vegan or something like that? Or? I think he's probably vegan. Okay. Yeah. In that case, I'd make him, um, there was a years ago, Charlie did this, uh, Charlie Trotter did this, uh, quote unquote, uh, is a vegetarian lasagna. And I think you can make it vegan fairly easily, but the noodles were done out of like, uh, turnips. Mm. And they were like, I don't know exactly the cooking method on it, but I would think that would be, uh, I would head in that direction if I was going to cook for Michael Stipe, who may be a vegan. <laughs> Weirdly, I've been listening to a lot of REM uh, recently, and it's uh, it's just hit me in the heart and uh, South Central Rain for some reason on repeat, night swimming on repeat sometimes too. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll send you that video know. and I'll, I'll link it in this too, because it's, it's a really lovely video of like, it's just yeah it's a gorgeous thing and i have one of the i just listened to uh gardening at night yesterday oh god yeah i i yeah i'm doing most of my stuff after dark just because people aren't around and it's uh yeah all all these things are sort of extra poignant right now (laughs) was there a question about historical figure or no Uh, no we can ask you that one after (laughs) we i'll ask you that in a second but uh okay if you have five uninterrupted minutes for self-care i mean we all have a lot of uninterrupted time now what what would you usually do because like i know that this is such an atypical time for you because usually you work so hard you hadn't had a you know day two days in a row off for the longest longest time what uh when you have a few minutes to yourself what do you do for self-care uh, generally speaking, I hang out with my dog. He's a great, Co- he's a great, Cody. the reason I said he's my third favorite dog is just because I happen to have yeah. two. <laughs> I should charge people to come in and like take five minutes and like give them a little belly rub and they'll, they'll all is right. <laughs> uh, and even just, even just taking a, a few minutes and going onto our terrace and like playing ball with him, you know, um, it, it you know, if I, if he's not around, if he's sleepy or something like that, um, if I uh, have a little extra time, um, when I go to shower, I would just like basically stand under really, really hot yeah. water for like five yeah. minutes. And I, I tend to like lean against the shower saw and like yeah. half sleep while I'm doing it. So and that's about it. Um, yeah, but yeah, generally, generally speaking, it, I, if I have like an extra five minutes with my dog, it's always a good. Yeah, I like your dog too. He finally decided he liked me, so <laughs> I'm good with him now. Well, you you know that that the dog i mean the dogs are like they're so engaged on the present that it's almost impossible for you to start to worry about what's going to happen in the future because right now the only focus is like 
this ball is the most important thing in the world to this little guy. I've been no. learning. I've been learning a lot so, from our dogs over yeah. the past. Oh, just what is the question you want me to ask you about historical figures? I feel like I've heard before there was some like sort of like historical figure or a person living or dead you would cook oh, for. I mean, I oh, think yeah. you answered it. You asked it. With yeah, yeah. Sense. I was asked about musicians, but but if it was just a historical figure, who would that be? I have been ready for this for for months. I, I it would <laughs> it would actually be Mr. Badger from uh, The Wind in the Willows. Oh my God, I love Mr. Badger. Like I, it was such a thing. My dad would read me those books when I was a when I was a kid, and he always like if friends of mine are having kids, he would send sends those books. Why in particular, Mr. Badger? Uh, I've always loved the scene where the uh, uh, mole and water rat get lost, and they come upon Mr. Badger's door, and then they stay up late at night, and they're talking. They've got the fire, and he makes them food, and they get up the next morning. And they're having again like ham and eggs. And they do rashes of bacon, and the way they describe the way Mr. Badger dressed, like his his, his, his waistcoat, his waistcoat, his firmness, his dressing gown, his slippers that were down at the heel, uh, the the way they described um, his dining hall. Like I've always wanted to be in a room like that where I could sit with friends and and have a port and and uh, smoke a pipe, you know. Um, and uh, I think Mr. Badger had uh, such a such a great firm graciousness to him, uh, and you know he uh, appreciated. The rules of society uh, and the manners, but also at the same time, he kind of turned his nose up at them a bit, you know. And he, uh, I think, Mr. Badger is a fascinating character in that book. I wish you could see my face because but... I'm smiling so hard right now, and I needed that really. <laughs> oh, okay. good. So, if, good. so if people wanted to find you, uh, I mean, right this moment, we all know where everybody is for the most part; they're at mm -hmm. their houses. Um, but if they wanted to follow you on social and watch. You know, with hope as Francie progresses, how do they find you? Well, my Instagram is just my name, John Win John Winterman, and then Francie mm -hmm. is Francie Brooklyn, F R A N C I E Brooklyn. Yeah, and opening at some time, hopefully well, sooner rather you, than later. If you're paying attention to Uncle Uncle Andrew today. Um, he mentioned the 29th extending non-essential business closures until the 29th mm -hmm. which would put francie at a second week of june opening mm -hmm. give or take i so, we'll see i can't wait to be there thank you thank you so much to my guest today john winterman and you know i i can't wait to sit down there at at the bar at francie and and clink a glass and and enjoy that um i want to thank our incredible podcast team, uh, Jen Martnick, Mar Margot Got Health, and Hallie Tarpley, and uh, Sarah Crowder, our photo editor. Um, you all just make this so much easier, and everybody's working from home right now, and it's been kind of scrappy, you know, putting stuff together, but I'm, I'm so grateful to them for what they've been putting into it. Uh, so this is part of Food & Wine Pro, as I mentioned at the top, and um, I'm really glad that this uh, section exists right now. It's in the magazine, it's online, it's some in the real world, and it's where we're really talking to people who work uh, it's it's for the benefit of people in the industry. We're talking about business, uh, you know, sort of business and leadership and challenges and all that. And um, the work we're doing right now is is really the most up to date information about what's going on in the restaurant world. And uh, you know, I wrote a guide recently to mental health and sobriety resources. Um, if you sign up for the newsletter, which you can easily from that page, if you go to foodandwine.com/fwpro, the uh, newsletter goes out on uh, Fridays, written by our editor-in-chief Hunter Lewis uh, with backup from me and our uh, associate restaurant editor Oset Babur. So please go ahead and sign up for that. Most importantly, take good care of yourself until the next time.